Good evening. How's everybody doing? Thanks for being here. And welcome to the first event in the New Neighbors series called Forced Displacement, The View from 10,000 Feet. My name is Eric Giordano, and I am the Executive Director of the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service. We're known as WIPS, and we are a unit of the University of Wisconsin System Administration. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the sponsors for the series for whom we are very grateful. The Ethiopian Community Development Council, also known as ECDC, the Wisconsin Humanities, Wisconsin Public Radio, and the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point at Wausau. We're very grateful for this campus and the ability to hold our events here. Tonight is the first of a multi part series on the topic of recent immigration to central Wisconsin. Our next event in this series will be January 25th at 7 p.m. also here in the theater. This will be a panel discussion featuring several local people who have been working with the recent arrivals to central Wisconsin. You can visit whips.org, W-I-P-P-S dot org for more information. Before I introduce our guest this evening, We'd like to share a video that was created by some of our friends and excellent um, videographers and filmmakers, Laura Hunt and Jordan Innes. Uh, these are some brief videos that will kind of set the stage for our discussion tonight, and I hope you'll enjoy them. A refugee is a survivor. difficult <laughs> باید یک را انتخاب میکردیم که بالاخره کریمه هم رای خود گفت اگه می ادامه میتونم حالا که مرا به قتل برسانه هم کلام مشکل نیست این همشیره هم این خانواده هم اونا هم دمی دود طالب هم میسوزه او را مرا رنج میتزید کمپانیه رو میاد که همانیسی هم مردوس این پانیوز مرکادوز جون رو اکسرانیو نه ده میکره هم مرا در داخل هم بای که کالایت هم پود کنین کشک بای کم کش کنین مرا ببرین و ما فقط در فکر جان خود بودیم که می گفتم ما کجا در کجا خواد رفتیم زندگی ما چی خواد شد فامیلم چی خواد شد که یک خانم امریکایی آمد این فاندو در میال ما یو سنتیا که اوی اصیر برای آن در اوی اید میدان اوی ترمینال که دیدیم تیم اسپانسر ما آمده بود اونجا امرای اتا تفلکایشان گرفته آمده با خود کلان کلان چارتای کلان کلانه نوشته کردن که فامیل به یقی خوش آمده این به وسا خیلی خوشحال شدم بخی گریه گریفت مرا او روز اصلا یادیم نموره تا زنده یوم یادیم است خیلی خوشحال بودم یعنی من یک جسد بودم که فقط امی جسد تیار جور شده بودم که ایچ چیز برای امید برای زندگی کردن نداشتم که اینا دوباره برای زندگی بخشیده نوال کردم <تصفيق> Hay gente de buenos corazones. Ya tenemos otra vida. The atmosphere of love they have surrounded you. The meal with they are healing this person from trauma. Me monosan donan ke naz kolishis kada insaniyat martaba u maqamish besar balas. Sar zamin amadin ke. کاملا کاملا مثل موری افراد اشخاص متضرری که از جنگ نفرین شده خسته هست اینا در آغوش خود گرفتن روی دادن When uh, I was driven into the city it was love at first sight و هر کسی که از این پرسان میکنه مثلا قصد داریم که مثلا از واسا برین و میگم نخیر چون که خیلی عالی You are changed my life by hosting me here. I'm so grateful for accepting me, for making it possible for me to start all over again. I present my gratitude, 
May God bless you. May God bless the people of America. May God bless America. We do, there are other videos that have been produced, but we're only showing this one tonight. Full length versions of each of those families' stories that you saw in the video will be screened as part of this series in February and March. Information as to the exact days and times will be uh, posted on the WIPS Facebook page and will be sent to those on the WIPS email list. If you need to join that list, please feel free to email us at info at whips.org. Now on to tonight's guests. After they have shared their presentations, there will be time for Q&A from the audience, so just keep that in mind and get your questions ready. First, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nehemat Najumi, who has extensive academic and policy analysis experience in conflict transformation, international security, private sector development, globalization and democratization. He is the managing editor of the sentinelpost.org and affiliated with a global network of scholars and practitioners, including the American and German business associations. He has worked as a senior advisor with the US government and NATO, as well as with non-governmental organizations, including the United Nations, the United States Institute for Peace, uh, of Peace, USIP, and the European Institute of Peace. As a professor at George Mason University, he has facilitated the transnational dialogue for nonviolence, uh, participated in by dozens of institutions and internationally respected figures from around the world. And I am pleased to say that he is now a WIPS Senior Fellow in Transatlantic Relations. He also recently wrote a book or put together, edited a book uh, called Consequences, which is available for sale in the lobby if you are interested and you can get more information there. Following Dr. Nanjumi, we'll hear from Boyana Zorich Martinez, who currently serves in two critical roles. One as the director of the Bureau of Refugee Programs with the Wisconsin Department of Children and Families, and the other as the Wisconsin State Refugee Coordinator representing the interests of the state's refugee resettlement before local and federal partners with whom she regularly communicates and coordinates service uh, provision. She also serves on the executive board of the state coordinators of refugee resettlement, the National Association of State Refugee Coordinators, Administrators, and Managers. And I'll just point out that uh, over dinner she was explaining that this is a really critical role because Wisconsin now actually has a voice on this national, in these national groups, whereas we did not before. So we're grateful for her service there. Boyana has been serving in the SRC role for over five years. She started her career in refugee work at, Mil at a Milwaukee resettlement agency in 2000. She then continued to build her educational and professional career in leadership, organizational development, and management. And Boyana has extensive knowledge and experience working in refugee resettlement and as a former refugee herself, she is grateful to have the opportunity to lead and help shape the programs she once advanced from. She believes that her success lies in effective collaboration with federal and local partners across different programs for benefit of refugees and other vulnerable populations. It's my pleasure to welcome both of them and let's start off by having Dr. Najumi come to the, come to the stand. Thank you, Dr. Najumi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Um, can you please tell me how to operate the slides? I think if you just... Um, this is this? Or yeah. Mm -hmm. Just as forward, just mm -hmm. pushing. Each time. Okay. Thank you very much. Good evening. I would like to thank the director, staff, and the distinguished fellows 
at the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Services for giving me the opportunity to be in front of you tonight. And tonight, um, I'm not talking in, on behalf of uh, any government or institutions. Uh, my, the contents of my presentation is based on my own case studies, research, and my own direct observation. Indeed, I have used um, uh, charts and illustrations that is produced by respected institutions. So the topic that I am talking is, uh, it is more than what you see in Wisconsin, is going to be covered in, on a broader spectrum at the global level, and then come from there step by step to how it is relevant to you or to us in the United States. So this is the agenda of the, is the agenda of my presentation. And generally, I'll uh, explain the um, global trend and uh, how it's relevant to the United States, and also um, offer some remedial uh, approaches to the crisis. In 2012, um, at the global level, we had only less than 50 million refugees, and these are mainly forcibly displaced individuals across the globe. Unfortunately, in the last 10 years, and by 2022, it has passed 100 million people. And within only uh, one decade. The main causes of refugees um, are comprises mainly of three issues. One, uh, it is the uh, wars and geopolitical violence, um, gross violation of human rights, uh, environmental degradation due to climate change, and as you see, this is the first time uh, recorded history that we have such a overblown population or number of people that they have been forced out of their homes and villages. And unfortunately, we don't have a global approach, a global policy to handle that and mitigate 50% um, of this population are children who are um, exposed to diverse level of trauma across conflict zones as well as destitute communities. Um, so, sorry, I have to look a little bit. I'll stand here. Where the refugees are coming from? This 100,000, and that 100,000 is minus, minus the, um, the 12 million refugees being caused uh, coming out of Ukraine. So if you look at the, the dark, um, highlighted dark blue, um, only a fraction of this population are seeking asylums, a teeny tiny fraction of this 100,000 or over 100,000 population, who they may or may not be resettled here in the United States or in Central European countries. The majority of refugees are resided in developing countries, neither in the United States nor in Europe, and ranging from Turkey to Ethiopia. Why it is connected to us and how it is relevant to the United States. If you look at, these are the four conflicts that the majority of the refugees in the world are coming from right now. In all these conflicts, the United States have been involved either directly or indirectly. And we have been given by successive administrations, whether under the control of Democrat or controlled by Democrats or Republicans, that there have been good causes for the international intervention 
into foreign wars and foreign conflicts. But if you look at the outcome of these four cases, for instance, and these are the top four generating refugees in the world, the outcome it says otherwise. In all these countries, except in Ukraine, which is a different situation, we have supported regime change in support of the local population who wanted to have a regime change in these countries. But at the end, in the case of Syria, the Assad regime is still in power. And uh, right now, working on normalization with the regional country. It is the same in Venezuela. And it is in, in the case of Afghanistan, um, after 20 years of uh, investment and presence in that country. Oh, thank you very much. Much better. Wow. So um, last, in, in, uh, when the uh, United States um, withdrew forces from that country, um, the national government collapsed. The Taliban took over, the same people that we have removed from power in 2001. In addition to that, um, the Taliban seized about $83 billion worth of weapon system that produced by us or provided by us. And billions more, hundreds of billions more um, investment in infrastructure and communication technologies that they, now they are under their control. And Afghanistan, again, is one of the um, hotbed of terrorist organizations and uh, radical groups. Um, so the, in, in the case of Ukraine, there are two narratives in our side from Washington and Brussels and European Union. We do believe that the Ukrainian war started with a, a Russian aggression. The Russian narrative and the Moscow allies is the otherwise. They are saying it is the United States pushed for the expansion of the European uh, NATO e toward the Eastern European country that provoked the um, Russian invasion. Regardless of these narratives, if you look at it, the number of people are suffering. Um, in the case of Syria, 21 million population, over 14 million pop uh, of the population are displaced or flood the country. In the case of Venezuela, we have 7 million um, flood the country and uh, more than 7 million are uh, internally displaced. And in the case of Afghanistan, uh, 2.6 million people flood the country and about 3.6 million people are IDPs or internal displaced persons and 25 million people are in desperate needs of humanitarian assistance. And in the case of Ukraine, we have over 12 million, which is, wasn't included in that chart that I showed you at the beginning, um, refugees and internal displaced individuals, and the country is in ruin. And 18 million of the 40, 40 million population are in dire need for humanitarian crisis, uh, assistance. So, this is what happened to those indigenous population. What had happened to us on our side? The interfering in, in uh, foreign wars and conflicts, even though it was started with a good intention and the bad outcome comes out of it, cost the United States tremendously financially. If you add the $2.2 trillion for the next 30 years for the uh, veteran cares, for those who served in Afghanistan and Iraq, we, the cost of this, these wars and these interventions is about $8 trillion. And so if you look at it, um, in the bottom of the chart, the budget of the Department of Defense, a department that I work with, has increased by 884 billion above the base in the last 20 years. So for this year, President Biden approved $885 billion for the Department of Defense, $45 billion 
um, new security assistance for Ukraine. And then if you compare and contrast with all other national, key national department and institutions, everybody is underfunded and the bulk of resources are still going in the uh, military expenditure. So, for instance, in the case of the Department of State and USAID, these are the two important strategic arms of the, our foreign policies. They are understaffed, they are under-resourced, they are underfunded so badly. And, uh, and look at it, the, for instance, the Department of uh, um, Education or Health and Human Services or the Small Business Administration that are so key for our local economy. And, and helping uh, the citizens and the communities. So in the long run, these wars, intervention, intervention and in, in, in wars and conflicts, put the federal government under two, bill, two trillion dollar worth of debt as of 2022. If we don't pay that by 2030, we have to pay two trillion dollar interest. By 2050, it reaches to 6.5 trillion. If you compare, to give you a, a comparative analysis, the budget of the state of Wisconsin is 6 billion, uh, 6, 660 billion a year. Of course, with 1.7 trillion reserve. The budget of the national government in the United, the federal government in the United States is 1.7 trillion for this year, 2003. How can we pay this? And the federal government borrowed money from um, internal resources that we have, mainly social security fund, and also about 20% from foreign governments, including China. So when it comes to refugee, and it, it falls under the public policy rather than the foreign policy. And if you look at it, the United States has one of the most shining history of refugee resettlement in the world. The images that you see, these are iconic symbols of Americans who came to this country as refugees. Yeah, from Albert Einstein to uh, Madeleine Albright, the first uh, women, woman secretary of the state, um, all the way to Steve Chen, the co-founder of uh, uh, YouTube, Sergey Brin, the co-founder of Google, and Hen Henry Kissinger in art and um, literature, uh, great Santana in music, or uh, Gloria Estefan, and so forth, so on. On the top left corner, Admiral, Rear Admiral um, Nguyen, he was five years old in Vietnam, South Vietnam when the entire his family were gunned down by the Vietnam, uh, Vietcongs, and he was hit on the shoulder and leg, rescued by his uncle, the last day before the fall of Saigon, um, airlifted to the United States. It resonates with what happened last year in Afghanistan and in Kabul, right? So unfortunately, with all this shining history, our system has been very sluggish in order to uh, achieve re refugee resettlement. In 2003, Congress um, put a cap for 125,000 per year for resettlement. And uh, even though at the time the um, number of refugees were below uh, 50 million globally, and uh, unfortunately, last year, um, the Biden administration could only um, resettled a little bit over 25,000, far below the 125,000 that the Congress has al uh, already allowed. And if you compare that with the European country, you see that uh, France, Germany, and Spain is smaller than the United States with less resources. They were able successfully to uh, resettle a larger number of refugees um, in, in, in within their own countries. Uh, President Biden promised to um, uh, have, we have about 100,000 refugees in the United States. 
that is the number that has been achieved at the end of the year, 1,610. The case of Afghanistan, it is a, um, a special type of case. We have uh, mainly um, veteran groups, civil society, churches, and, and many others got together and airlifted about 120,000. This is one of the biggest since uh, Saigon, the fall of Saigon. Uh, about uh, 67,000 landed in the United States, but unfortunately without any pre-planning or providing sources or providing communication for these people, and they just dropped them in various different communities, and then you are now facing here in Warsaw that they need the communities to really help them. So, and there are about 70,000 more uh, waiting for um, a special immigration visa. I doubt that they're going to um, get that. Given the situation in Afghanistan, there is no way that anybody can approve it until, approve them or vet them before they come, until there is a, a, a new plan or new program is established. So, we, as a, as, a, as a nation, citizens, we have civic accountability and responsibility that hold us morally and strategically responsible for what's going on in the, uh, what has caused this refugee crisis. If you take an aerial picture of a healthy democracy, you will see that a, society, a democratic society comprised of three components, which is the civil society, and the citizen and their participation in the political process, which is the biggest portion, yeah? And then you have public sector and the private sector. In reality, this governance by the people and for the people, by the people are the civil societies and, and the citizen. And for the people, it is the job of the government to regulate and ma mainly manage and control the public sector to serve the common good. In a, this refugee crisis that we are saying, it has to be, we must bring that to the public space. In public space, oopsie, it is an area where genuine leaders are coming forward. No, it went too far. So the moral obligation that we have is based on the, our commitment to the 1950 Refugee Convention and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And all the laws in the land that dealing with the refugees and the resettlement has to um, consist in with the, these com com commitments. So the, it is not only the state, it is not only the federal government, Communities, institutions, and citizens, they have their own role and obligations to um, deal with the situation and be aware of it, inform themselves, and in order to make it easier for these new arrivals, our new neighborhood, neighbors into our communities. So, of course, healthy citizens are coming out or arising from healthy communities. And if we don't really ha build the needed infrastructure for the new arrivals, it is very difficult to um, uh, claim that we are a healthy community and healthy society. And indeed, civil society and other organization, like the one uh, forum that we had today at the um, Wisconsin uh, Institute for Public Policy and, and uh, Services, that different component of the state, different component of the society and the city coming together in order to finding um, common ground resolution are absolutely essential. So this is my last slide. At the strategic responsibility of the citizen, we are a connected world now. We cannot stay alone and run away from this kind of problem that we are also part of the problem. So we need to, as a nation, find a way, a different alternative when it comes to foreign policy rather than engaging in these conflicts and war. At the end, after all this 
trillion dollar of investment, the outcome hasn't been desirable. And that is a lesson that every citizen has to hold their elected representative accountable. They need to come to their whole town and explain and, and, and answer your questions. For instance, in the case of Afghanistan, how it could collapse suddenly? Didn't we know anything about it? How many times the leadership came to your town or the elective, elected of, uh, representatives? Those who are funding, borrowing money from key institutions and from even foreign government to, to bankroll some of the engagement that we have across the, the world. So we need to find mechanism to prefer cooperation over confrontation and also find measures or support, measures are there, support efforts to reduce this geopolitical violence in the form of conflict management, peace building, peace development, and so forth, so on. On the top of that, it is so important to, we cooperate with our rivals. Many of these conflicts, either the Chinese or the Russians are involved in it. We need to compete and be rival at the meantime we have to keep the line of communication open in area of diplomacy and area of shared common purposes to reduce the number of these conflicts. And, and so at the local level, state to state, state to, um, and also at, we have, for instance, on the, on the European side, massive amount of experience that they have on uh, handling this crisis. We need mechanism to let this side of Atlantic to communicate to the other side of Atlantic in order to learning lesson and maximizing our ability and effort in order to handle. So the, when you look at the, um, at the global level, sustainable development is key essential ingredient that we can offer to the world. And we have the resources, it is in our vested interest and it, is, it, it, it serves our national security interests in many different regions. The top four countries that are providing and contributing to the sustainable development are these. Unfortunately, the United States from 2001 until now, it fell, came down to rank, rank now it is rank 41, somewhere between Cuba and Bulgaria. So, as a community, as a nation, we are morally obligated to question our representative when they legislate and fund the militarization of the foreign policy. While we can contribute, think about eight trillion dollars, we could have supported the Latin American countries to prevent the massive influx of migrants. We could have done very differently in many of those countries that the refugees are coming from. So these are at the end of the day, you are the one that governing and the government is serving you or serving us in general. Thank you very much. I end here and pass the floor to my co-panelists. You don't want this? Yeah, I'll, I, see, I get I'll see what, but I'll t give you this, yeah. Okay, thanks. Can I have that quick there? Yeah. All right, can you hear me? No, not now? How about now? Oh, great, okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, just when I think I know a lot about refugee resettlement and the humanitarian crisis, I, I realize how little I know um, because there's just so much that I've learned tonight, and so thank you very much. Uh, that was very powerful. Uh, thank you, Wasa, for having me again. I am so glad to be here. I was just thinking about it and reflecting on the fact that almost two years ago was when I received um, a call from um, Mayor Rosenberg, uh, Senator, oh, Senator, well, Senator Baldwin's office as well, as well as uh, Pastor Voss and, and her team, and 
um, to say, hey, we, Wausau is ready to welcome new neighbors. And that was music to my ears. And how do we do that? Uh, let's assess if we're really ready, uh, what our neighbors think about that, how do we engage community, and here we are, almost two years later. We have Multicultural Community Center and Adam and his team who are doing amazing work. Uh, quite a few individuals have been welcomed already and quite a few on the way. Uh, just so very proud of where, uh, how far we've come. And I have to tell you that I, I often go to DC and to a lot of meetings with federal and national and state and local partners, and I always bring up WASA. So if your ears are ringing, it's probably me telling all the, all the people in power about all the great work that is being done in WASA. So thanks for having me again. Thank you, WIPS, for inviting me, and thank you for letting me share a little bit of my perspective and, and a little bit of state perspective and, and kind of painting a picture of how we do things and how everything that my colleague here has uh, talked to you about really um, is demonstrated on a local level. So let's try to do that. And then uh, just forewarning, I do have a lot of slides. I may not stop on every single one of them. This is just a presentation I probably have done it about 200 times over the last uh, year and a half or so. And so um, if you have questions afterwards, we can address them. But um, you already heard my name, Boyana Zoric Martinez. I'm have two roles. I work as the director of the Bureau of Refugee Programs within the Wisconsin Department of Children and Families, uh, probably one of the most amazing teams made up of a lot of refugees and people of different backgrounds and people who have worked overseas um, um, helping, helping others who needed help the most. Um, and I also serve as the Wisconsin State Refugee Coordinator. So I get to bring my chair to uh, a lot of people in power in DC and other areas who are, uh, I'm learning, listening to what we have to say. So very proud of that. And then um, every state in the United States that actively resettles refugees has a designated state refugee office that coordinates refugee resettlement for that state and for Wisconsin, that is the Bureau of Refugee Programs. And then every state has a designated state refugee coordinator who's the point person in the face of resettlement. And I have the honor and the privilege of serving in that role for almost six years, actually, two, two weeks shy of that. Um, I started my role four days prior to the first executive order on refugees, also known as Muslim ban or refugee ban in, in 2017. So it's been baptism by fire ever since, and it's been quite a ride, but I think we're doing good. I think we're doing good. Um, my team uh, at DCF receives federal funding uh, from the Office of Refugee Resettlement, which is under the Department of Health and Human Services. And then we contract with some 30 or so partners across the state who provide direct services to refugees. So we do not work directly with refugees, but we oversee those uh, who do. We make sure everything's in compliance and refugees are getting what they need. I'm of a belief that anyone in my state is also my responsibility uh, from the refugee backgrounds. Now, I don't know what pe happens behind the closed doors in people's homes. I can't control that. But every resource that is available out there that they're eligible for, they should get from my point of view. Um, so just very briefly, who are refugees? Refugees are people who are prosecuted or fear prosecution based on some of those different uh, criteria that have been defined by the, by the United States, uh, uh, religion, race, nationality, and so on. Uh, one important thing to remember is that refugees, by US definition, are those who have already come to the United States with refugee status, meaning when they put their foot on, on the American soil, they already have all the rights, just like you and I do. Although I will say, and I was told you need to say this every time you talk, is that I am also of a refugee background. I came to the US back in 1999 from former Yugoslavia as a refugee and went through my own path of resettlement where I didn't speak a word of English, I didn't know anything about the American culture outside of 90210, which is so true for those of you who have ever watched Beverly Hills 90210, so true. As soon as I landed in Wisconsin, I realized that was true, not. Um, and so, um, so then I worked in refugee resettlement for a number of years doing uh, a lot of things that, again, Adam and his team and New Beginnings and Multicultural Community Center and, and others are doing um, 
you know, being hands-on and providing everything and anything that refugees need it. Just imagine, as I just uh, mentioned in the interview with Channel 9, um, just imagine just being kind of ripped from your home and being placed somewhere else where you don't know anything and have nothing on you but clothes on your back. So everything that um, these individuals who provide direct services to refugees do, um, my hat's off to you because I know how it is. Anyhow, um, my colleague spoke a little bit about the numbers. These are the numbers by UNHCR uh, given in 2022, uh, I believe, or you probably see it better than I do. About 90 million people are displaced across the world. Um, 30 million of them have that refugee designation, and again, half of them are children. Now think about this, only 1%, under 1% actually, of all world refugees actually get to immigrate to a country of their choosing or a country that will accept them. Less than 1%. So those who are here are lucky. I am lucky. My family's lucky because we made it. IDP means, in case you're wondering, internally displaced people. So there's a lot of people who are displaced within their own country. Where am I? Uh, okay, so what rights, uh, what options do they have? Voluntary repatriation to the country where they immigrated from? Well, a lot of Ukrainians are thinking they're going to be going back. So when things calm down, I'm going to go back. Will that be the case? We don't know. But in some cases, that happens. Permanent resettlement in a neighboring country. So for example, when I for those of you who might be familiar with how former Yugoslavia looked way back then, there were six different republics, but then when the war started, they all separated, they all became their own countries. And so I immigrated from Bosnia and went to Serbia, and that's where, and at that time was a different country. So one of the things that I could have done, had I had better um, opportunities there, could have stayed there um, because I gained refugee status in that country. But my dad had the American dream, and he thought that he belonged in the U.S., questionable, very questionable some days. Um, I'm kidding, but uh, he's doing very well. He's great. Um, he wanted to come to the United States, and we were like, who's, gonna, who, who's waiting for you there? And so he applied, and there were four different countries who um, were accepting refugees at that time that we could apply through the International Organization for Migration, and one of them was... Uh, New Zealand, I think Canada and Australia, and then US, and we applied, and, and there it was. So um, I talked about refugees, but we, we often say refugees, but it's not just refugees who are served under our programs. It is asylees and victims of trafficking and Cuban Haitian entrance and uh, certain admirations from Vietnam, and now most recently, Afghans and Ukrainians. I'm sure you've heard of Operations Allies Welcome and all the involvement that we had with uh, Fort McCoy and then with the resettlement of Afghans not only in Wausau but across the state. In federal fiscal year 2022, uh, and I think I'm going to talk about that as well, we've welcomed some 868 Afghans, some from Fort McCoy, some from the other military bases that have um, found homes in Wisconsin. Uh, so how does it work? Uh, I have a colleague who loves to do this. And I hate to click through it, but here it is. Um, you can't really read too much of that, but you know, those of you that can, it really works. Uh, where um, overseas, so I gave my example of being a refugee from Bosnia, going to Serbia, applying to uh, get to, uh, you know, going through the application process. It usually takes about two years for regular refugee resettlement, in case you didn't know. Um, and then you have all kinds of. Uh, United States uh, refugee uh, program interviews and vetting, and I'll show you in a bit, nine different U.S. agency do vetting background and you know criminal background, health background, and those types of things. Um, checking before somebody's actually authorized to come to the United States. You know, when, when Operations Ally, Allies Welcome started and we started welcoming people at Fort McCoy, I received hundreds of calls from all over and the number one question was, uh, the most common question was, are these people vetted? And so um, that is very much, again, what a lot of people are, are, are asking. They are very, very much vetted. And I will show you in, in a minute like a, uh, a list of all the different agencies who are doing the vetting. Um, 
But pretty much what happens is once uh, somebody, a family goes through uh, the application process and they go through a number of interviews and, and screenings, then they are approved and their case is then uh, by an overseas processing center referred to the uh, Department of State Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration who then uh, works with uh, nine n different national VOLEGs or resettlement agencies to uh, figure out where they're going to be placed. And so, for example, in my case, um, they asked during that process if we had any friends or family in the United States, and we didn't. So my dad said, no, you know, places anywhere. Because a lot of times they will ask that because integration is much better self-sufficiency becomes much quicker if you know somebody in the area you know that they, they become kind of they you lean on them more and they help you in many ways and so we didn't and they placed us in milwaukee and there was but um anyhow so the then the resettlement agencies are working amongst themselves to decide as to what what's the best placement and which one of the organizations will be involved in how things will work from there uh, the next slide really is pretty much the same as, as the first, so I'm not going to uh, focus on that too much, but um, some of this material can also be available for you if, in case you are uh, interested. So here's that slide that I uh, told you about, the nine different agencies who are doing the vetting before the refugees can come here. And so refugees are amongst the most vetted um, group, that immigration group that comes to our country. One of, the, one of the things that I think is important to say is the process of rigor is that, uh, let's say, you know, there's a, a health screening that needs to be done for TB and some of the other, like, communicable diseases, and that's good for, like, six months, and then in case the rest of the process is not continuing within the six months, it has to go back. So the process is just very long. So who resettles refugees? So as I said, there's nine different... Oh, at ten, actually, because we've just... <laughs> um, we just there was just a new uh, resettlement agency that was added to the mix, and then there is going to be one more. But ten different uh, national resettlement organizations, and I haven't updated the slides, so forgive me for that. But I'll mention them. Um, and these are the resettlement agencies who have their local affiliates. So in your case, there's Ethiopian uh, Community Development Council, who is. Uh, the national organization, so the national VOLEG or the National Resettlement Agency, but then the Multicultural Community Center is actually a local affiliate of that national agency. So that's the relationship. So ECDC is one of the nine, and then uh, MCC is a local affiliate that's actually doing resettlement. So every case is then referred to one of these nine organizations, and then they work among themselves. And so Adam, for example, and his team will receive what's called a biodata sheet, and they'll say, okay, a family from, I don't know, Somalia, a family of seven from Somalia is coming, and usually information's limited on, like, you know, there's some information, but not really um, as much as our case managers would benefit from, I feel sometimes, uh, right? So the, you know, there's their language, religion, um, ages, if there are any specific disabilities or complex medical needs and things like that, that will be listed. But otherwise, um, that's it. And then so when Adam receives this bio data, he gathers his team, I assume, and say, okay, this is what we have. How do you guys feel? Do we have housing? Uh, available? Are we going to be okay if we assure this family? It's called assurance. And then they say to ECDC, yep, we're going to take this family. We feel pretty confident that we can take them and we're going to serve them well. And they sign this sheet, they send it back, and the pro this clock starts ticking. They start working with new beginnings and all the other volunteers, some of them I see here in the room, and they start getting things ready, setting up apartments and doing everything else that needs to be done to uh, make it a home for the new neighbor. These are the uh, nine different national organizations, so you can, I can tell you who they are in Wisconsin uh, once we go. So these are the nine, but then in Wisconsin, again, my colleague who loves to do this stuff, uh, <laughs> we have the USCRI, their local affiliate is the International Institute of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. If you've heard of Holiday Folk Fair International, they also do that, so that's that organization. We also have Lutheran Social Services of Wisconsin and Upper Michigan in Milwaukee, so those are the two in Milwaukee. We have Catholic Charities in Green Bay, Jewish Social Services in Madison, 
uh, who am I forgetting? World Relief in the Fox Valley area, and then the newest and mighty, small but mighty, uh, uh, Multicultural Community Center under ECDC here in Wausau. So who's arrived? Um, some of the numbers and graphs and pictures you've already seen, but here's something that I think is worth mentioning. Every year, the president consulta in consultation with Congress sets the ceiling for uh, how many arrivals we're going to get. The blue line is the ceiling. Is it? Are you better seeing that, or am I? Okay. So the blue line is the ceiling, and then orange is uh, the actual. So you can tell that in many years, that really followed. But then you can see 9-11 happening, right? And the line dipping, and then going back up. And then you can see the beginning of the previous administration and how things were affected. And then, of course, COVID had a lot to do with it as well. But, um, but definitely, the program was close to being gutted under the previous administration and is now starting to go back up again. In terms of the numbers, uh, Wisconsin, I can tell you this, Wisconsin has never been a leader as it relates to numbers. We're always kind of in the middle, 20, 25th place, somewhere in there, um, as for arrivals. But in terms of effective programming and close collaboration within our state and, and partners, we, we, we are definitely getting up there. Um, this is a 2022, so FY, meaning October 1st, through September 30th, October 1st, 21, to uh, September 30th, 2022. This is how many arrivals uh, we had. This is refugees. This does not include Afghans. So the, the, the total refugee resettlement that includes the Afghan population and the regular refugee process re uh, uh, population is 1554. So we're 868 and 686 or something like that. Um, but I can tell you that in um, over the years, this is what numbers look like. So you can tell that in federal fiscal year 2016, I believe we're somewhere around 1,700 or so, and then those numbers just went down from there. And that has a lot to do with, again, that ceiling that was set and the number of arrivals that were allowed in the country from, from the refugee uh, countries. Uh, ceiling is now set for 125,000. However, it takes time to rebuild capacity overseas. Remember those processing centers we talked about and where I went for an interview and all that? That's also uh, almost, that also almost was gutted because of the, the policies that, you know, came from Washington, but that has slowly st uh, started to rebuild. And so it will take time to get up there, but the ceiling is currently set at 125,000. Will we get there? Probably not, but we're definitely working towards that number. Oh, I forgot to mention um, SIVs. You're probably wondering what that means. Those, those, those are special immigrant visa holders. So 20 years ago, a program was put forward. So it was after 9-11 uh, for people from Afghanistan and Iraq who worked with the American government overseas they were in return given the opportunity to immigrate to the United States with their family. So when uh, Taliban took over last year, or God, it's been a year and a half, August of uh, 2021, um, we knew that there were going to be people who already entered the SIV process who might not have been able to finish it. And so those were the people that were brought here as part of the Operations Allies Welcome. But some of them, again, have already started this special immigrant visa program. And so uh, those are the arrivals through the special immigrant visa uh, program. I mentioned the Operations Allies Welcome. You probably know there were eight different military bases that housed the Afghans. Uh, we were the biggest base uh, here in Wisconsin. We're also the base that everyone even today talks about when you talk about best practices. We didn't think about it at the time because we thought everything was going wrong, especially within the first few weeks. But I can tell you that Fort McCoy really, truly led the effort um, with the federal agencies, of course, at the realm, but um, a lot of local partners, a lot of you and community members have stepped forward with all kinds of things, from donations to volunteering to 
just many, many. I, I, we received such an outpour of support that it was just incredible to see. Hundreds of calls offering homes. I was just mentioning at dinner, um, some of the most powerful calls that I've received in my role, or as long as I've worked in refugee resettlement, formally or later as a volunteer, um, was when I received calls from vets who would say, I am looking for so-and-so. They saved my life overseas. And I'm going, willing to move out of my house to offer him, in one case it was her as well, um, and, and their family room. I will figure it out, but they need safety. And they provided me with safety. And now it's my turn. That was very powerful. That tells who we are. So um, I'm not going to talk about too much of programming. I'm going to make sure that there is time for questions, because I'm sure you have some. But um, uh, I mentioned earlier that the Bureau of Refugee Program receives this federal funding um, that we are then act as a pass-through entity for the service providers. Um, under the Operations of Allies Welcome, the programming has really expanded. And so there was this program called APA, which is the Afghan Placement Assistance Program. Uh, you may know that when refugees come, there's this intense first 30 to 90 days where everything kind of must be done, right? Too short, we all agree. Nonetheless, we can't get, a get away from it. It is that first 90 days that is crucial. And so then, uh, based on that program called Reception and Placement, the federal government built the APA, what we call program, to help with the Afghans for that first 90 days post-resettlement. So first 90 days after, they would leave a base. I have to tell you this. Um, I was in D.C. last month, and um, at Fort McCoy, I met a woman who was a, a number of women who were uh, women's rights activists. Uh, here and um, for whatever reason, nobody wanted to stay in Wisconsin. I don't know why, but nobody wanted. To. I'm kidding. They went to Virginia, and she now works for um, uh, the university there, um, doing a lot of uh, a lot of women's rights um, research and a lot of kind of looking back on, on Afghanistan and what happened there. And so, she hosted me for dinner, and she invited a number of her uh, friends who were doing the same thing. Um, and we had a nice conversation, but we met at Fort McCoy. And she talked to me about the impact that the welcoming in our state had on their further path, right? And how supported and welcome they felt. So, um, so that was great. And then I was walking around Capitol um, cause be between the events, and there was these four guys that were standing there trying to take a picture. And one of them says to me, ma'am, and I'm like, oh, God. Um, he goes, can you take a picture of us? And I'm thinking, yes. And he goes, I said, where are you from? And they said, Afghanistan. And I thought, oh, great. So I started a conversation with them and told them about Fort McCoy. And one of them says, Barrack, 2058. I was there. And I'm like, oh, my God. So was I. I came to visit many times. And so it's really great to, to connect with people that, are coming here and to hear their stories and to hear how much it meant for them when we opened our doors and, and our arms to their needs and just listening, it just means the world. Anyhow, uh, again, my colleague uh, mentioned uh, the, the war in Ukraine. As you all know, um, what was it, February 23rd, 23rd here, 24th overseas of last year when we received the call that uh, Ukraine was invaded and that, you know, what do we do now? And of course, anything that happens overseas or on the border, we are the first to get a call to say, what do we do? What do we do? Where, where do we go? How do we help? Or what's going to happen with these people? And so um, the federal government put together a program called Uniting for Ukraine and promised to resettle about 100,000 Ukrainians. Um, in the United States through a program that will now um, match their relatives here in the United States. So their relatives, their friends, people who knew Ukrainians overseas could put together this affidavit of financial support, um, uh, vouching that they were 
uh, support them once they're here. And so that expedited some 100,000 uh, Ukrainians who've already come here, um, and the program is still ongoing. Uh, and then that expanded to offering to anyone who might not know people overseas in Ukraine, but who still wanted to help. And so that program, again, is still ongoing. A uh, number of programs that we have, uh, and these are some, and these are not, when you think about it, oh my God, that's a lot of programs, that's a lot of money. Eh, some of them are pretty small, Adam and I talked about that earlier, but there's still some support, and there's been more growing support for both Afghans and the Ukrainians. Um, Self-sufficiency, well-being, employment, and community connectedness are really the goals of the programs. I will tell you that over the years, uh, resettlement program really was all about employment, or yeah, resettlement program, all about employment. It's all about the numbers because numbers will show, you know, how many people are getting, how many people are serving, and in return, we're going to get this much funding. Well, especially in the last 10 years, I think we've been changing that to look at the whole family and that holistic approach. I know that's a popular word, but it's real. And not just thinking about the employable adults, but thinking about the entire family because the adult cannot be successful if their child is not where they need to be. So thinking about that and, and looking at programming that will encompass all those things has really been something that we've been focusing on. A lot of people ask me about unaccompanied refugee minors because there's a lot of minors out there that may not have a family. And so unfortunately, Wisconsin does not have a uh, formal unaccompanied refugee minor program. There is an, an occasion where minors are joining their, their relatives, like their grandparents or aunts and uncles, and in that case, it goes through like the regular foster care program. Um, but for the most part, um, uh, we, don't have, we don't have the program, like some of the states, like Michigan, for example, has the largest in the entire country on a company minor program. And um, I will say this, that because um, I just uh, I forgot to mention the tenth resettlement uh, national resettlement agency, that's Bethany Christian Services. They've been involved a lot in an accompanied refugee minor space, and now they're 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 the affiliate, or they're the national. Um, and numbers, there's a number of way, number of ways to help. Um, I left this slide up because I know in a lot of presentations that we do, people ask, what can I do to help? And these are some of the ways, but most importantly, supporting the infrastructure that's already there, there and building off of that. So volunteering with the agency that resettles people is really key and asking them as to how they can be supported. We have a number of volunteers who mean well but sometimes the intent does not match, ma match the impact. And so we wanna make sure, and I know that um, MCC and, uh, is really um, trying to coordinate the effort so that people are not duplicating things, but are working in continuation with one another. And, and that's really important. So uh, when first the, um, the Operations Allies Welcome happened, a lot of people asked like, well, you know, what do I do, how do I donate, or how do I, you know, um, give my time and, and I think working with the local resettlement agency is key. Now, we don't only work with the resettlement agencies, we work with a number of different organizations, health departments, clinics, health and mental health providers, um, school districts, um, ESL providers, those who provide services to older refugees, citizenship, I mean, there's a whole array of things. I mean, think about just what it would take for somebody to become self-sufficient. And, and so that's really, uh, one of the things that, again, is important to highlight is if people want to help, they should work with their local resettlement agency. And that should do it. I am so proud of the fact that I didn't get to red light, only to yellow, because um, I can talk. Um, but I think it's time for questions. So I'll take a seat, turn on the mic, and we can take questions. Right, Neymar? Thank you. So we do have a question from an online viewer. This is from Frank. There are a small number of citizens that believe that refugees are given the right to vote. Can you clarify this? Please also discuss availability of medical assistance, Medicare, and Social Security. Yes, 
Uh, thank you for that question. Frank, was it Frank? Excellent. Thank you, Frank, for the question. No, refugees cannot vote until they're citizens. Um, a year after a refugee enters the, the country, they're eligible to apply for their permanent residency, also known as green card. And then once they apply for that, they get their permanent residency, um, they're permanent resident. But then four years and six months after entering the country, uh, they are also eligible to apply for citizenship. That usually takes six months to a year. I'm not gonna, don't, don't quote me on that. I know it's, it's, it's different, USCIS is pretty overwhelmed these days, but um, uh, they usually, after five years, they, they gain their citizenship. And it is only after they have citizenship that they can register to vote and then vote. As for the eligibility for the other programs that you've mentioned, uh, Frank, uh, the uh, el uh, refugees are eligible for uh, a TANF program, so W-2, Wisconsin Works, in our uh, state for uh, families. Um, and that is a um, cash assistance. Um, and again, there's a number of activities, employment and employability activities that are tied to that. So they have to participate in those in order to be able to receive those benefits. If they are an unmarried couple or single people without children, they are eligible for what's called refugee cash assistance, which it mirrors the TANF side or W-2, and that goes for up to eight months. And again, there's a number of activities tied to that as well. As for medical assistance, they're eligible for, uh, for the most part, for badger care in our state. Uh, as Wisconsin Medicaid, and that also goes for the first eight months. Um, a lot of people ask uh, about, you know, different breaks that refugees get. I can tell you that refugees in the process of coming to the United States have to sign a paper through the International Organization for Migration promising that six months after entering the country, they're going to start paying off their airfare tickets. So that's the extent of that. I mean, there's everything that you and I are eligible for, they're eligible for in terms of like unemployment benefits if they're working and things like that. Um, but they're also obligated to pay for everything that you and I are. I hope that answers your question, Frank. To, uh, is there talks to, to continue that, or what's the status of that? What did I do? There are talks to continue the efforts. That's, that's all I know. Thank you. Numbers floating around in my head, but but see a hundred million refugees. Uh, tell me, how does the? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure I understand sort of the 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 the, the migrants at our, look our southern border. The, some are uh, some are refugees, some are not. We also have workers. I, it kind of help me sort of understand that situation. And we obviously have a lot coming into Wisconsin, and some are. I, anyway, it helped me sort of fold into some of that kind of, maybe it's regular migration, I, any, but they're not refugees. Help sort that out for me, can you? Sure. Um, under the Geneva Convention and the uh, 1950 Refugee Convention that we are committed, is it on? Uh, on the Universal Declaration of, okay. Universal uh, Declaration of uh, Human Rights. There are a specific definition when it comes to um, refugees or migrants or whatever. But the key point here that we talk about that 100,000, uh, 100 million, and now it is over 100 million. These are forcibly displaced individuals. That they come, um, uh, they are, and we, when our area of uh, work Whoever leaves their countries because of fear of persecution or whatever reason they are fleeing, they called refugees. But if my, my colleague has mentioned within the 
U.S. legal system, refugee means whoever has been vetted and came here, and that person is a legal resident, which is a, a different definition. Migrants are part of these 100 million people. And uh, unfortunately, the reality is that as we continue the way we have been continuing in the last 20 years, um, and bankrolling some of these involvement in these conflicts or wars, and as people are running, they have to run somewhere, those who survive. Turkey cannot hold anymore. Um, uh, the EU um, pays Turkey to a certain extent and pays to um, Cyprus and Greece and, uh, to a certain extent. There are millions of refugees in Iran, millions of refugees in Pakistan, across Latin America, across different parts of uh, Africa. And it goes to back to the uh, uh, very simple fact. The world is now regional. Even the United States by itself alone, this mighty nation can, cannot survive. We are a part of North American agreement. And we have trade agreement. We have many different relationships. So in order to manage those at the border, rushing to the border, southern border, um, we have to work at the regional level, level within the um, Latin American region. And in order to, this is what I mentioned about the uh, in, in investment in sustainable development. So these people stay there or they go back there. Millions of refugees that are in the developing countries, the absolute majority, they want to go back. But there is no condition to go back. There is not home to go back. So this is an area that we need to really hold our elected official accountable. And when it comes to foreign policy, we need to come to international assistance and humanitarian assistance and so forth and so on. So I hope I, I, I can clear a little bit. On the technical area, I think you, you should add a little. Yeah, thank you. So I just wanted to clarify, and I really appreciate that question. And, and I appreciate it because I personally feel that every conversation should, be, should start with the definition. <laughs> Because I think we're using these terms interchangeably, and it's not always right. Because, you know, we're showing these numbers, and then we're saying this, and then it, so it's 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 mixed messages, right? And so it's important to clarify that. So I mentioned the number of 90 million. My colleague mentioned 100 million. My numbers are from federal fiscal year. His are probably updated, and so we're somewhere there, right? But these are people who are displaced in the world, meaning they can be displaced for different reasons and in different countries. But that does not mean, by U.S. definition, that they got refugee status. 30 million people were like me, where I left my home country, went to the neighboring country, and re gained refugee status. And so then when you think about the U.S. definition, who we talk about as refugees, as pointed out, are those people who are vetted, who went through the United States refugee application process, and then we're given, we're given the paper, when they come here, they have residency and they have legal status. So those are refugees. When we say refugees, we really mean that. Um, and then I'm not gonna go more on the, on, on the southern border, but I think um, you know, there's different definitions that have been used by media, by even service providers, by the federal government, but just so many different entities that I work with that, and I'm even confused as to what people mean. So you're going to hear things like migrants, immigrants, um, refugees. You're going to hear refugees as well. You're going to hear all kinds of things. And so I think it's an important thing to remember that immigrants are all of these different groups. Refugees are immigrants as well, but not every immigrant is a refugee. So. I apologize on behalf of all the people that are confusing you. They're confusing me, too. <laughs> Thank you. Just a friendly reminder, if you have a question, please keep your hand raised until the microphone gets to you before you ask. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I work with a lot of Hispanic community here, and. Uh, we have a growing Nicaragua community, Venezuelan community. But prior to that, the largest group still remains the Mexican community. 
and I know that you would probably definitely open doors to help people, but how is it that people from Mexico, with all the problems there's there by government, prosecution, human rights and everything, are not classified as or can apply for a refugee status? And, and that creates a problem even here because the uh, people the, of that community that are here today feel very shunned that uh, different communities coming in and they are having benefits to which mm -hmm. they have been here 15, 20 years. I'm not saying it's not good, but you can imagine how they feel. Completely. I get this question a lot. In fact, when the Uniting for Ukraine started, I got a lot of calls that says, wait a minute, like, are these people are coming here within weeks and my family's been waiting overseas in a refugee camp forever. So I get that. I completely understand. So uh, you cannot gain refugee status once you are in the United States. And that's really, that's, that's the simplest answer to that. Once you're in the United States, you can apply for asylum, but refugees gain refugee status overseas and they already come here with refugee status. If somebody's crossing the border, or if somebody's from Mexico or some of the other countries, they're crossing the border and they're on the US soil, they cannot apply for refugee status. By US definition, they cannot be refugees. A lot of the individuals will then apply for asylum. Now, asylum takes, for you probably know this, it takes like a couple of years for processing, right? And while they're in the process for asylum, unless you're a pregnant woman or a child under 18 who may be qualified under an extended Medicaid program, you're not eligible for anything. You are not eligible for any benefits. You can't even work. And so that's where the issues we see are the most. And that's what we're seeing now is issues with the communities that are coming up, Nicaraguans and Venezuelans and some of the others. And so recently, 24,000 Venezuelans were allowed to come here in a similar program to Uniting for Ukraine where they could have sponsors, meaning a relative can sponsor them and sponsor the process while they're here. They can sponsor them and then they can be kind of living with them and off of them for the, for, for the, the uh, processing time. It is an issue. I know it's an issue. We receive more and more calls, and we see everything that's going on. Um, unfortunately, um, the policies that we are, you know, seeing nowadays do not allow for these populations to be eligible for services and benefits, and so they are not eligible for programs under the Office of Refugee Resettlement, those employment and employability programs that refugees, asylees, SIVs, victims of trafficking, and others are. I'm learning so much as you answer questions. So that brings to mind, how do the potential refugees in the other countries, in Europe, in Central and South America, learn the procedures that are required to become, they just Google it because there's, I mean, that's everywhere. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you for the question. Um, I have the opportunity to work with, uh, on the subject uh, across, within European Union. Um, they um, have various different mechanisms in order to, uh, even there is a general um, rules that have been sanctioned by the European Parliament, but each country has also its own um, s uh, different sets of re regulations. First of all, they have a quota system. When the refugee comes in a big number, uh, each country uh, gets uh, their own share. And some of them, especially across the Eastern European nations, they reject to do that, do so. Um, uh, when it comes to integration, every one of these countries do have a program called integration. And they have uh, um, uh, many ways to um, even have classes on cultural issues for women, for children, and they tell, for instance, education is compulsory here. 
in, in either in Germany or in France or any of these Scandinavian countries. And you cannot, uh, you're responsible to send your kid to school um, every day. If the kid doesn't show at school, um, the security, the police will go to after them. And when it comes to um, protection and enforcement of uh, children's rights, this is a huge issue, and they take it very seriously. Um, they remove children from the parents that abuse their children. And, uh, um, and there are many different institutions, especially civil society, are pretty active um, in uh, cooperating and working with the federal and the state and local governments. Um, in the case of, uh, for instance, Germany, they have Department of Families. And it is like an administra national ad administration that uh, the care of the children across the country, regardless they are um, um, uh, citizens or refugees, uh, falls under the obligation of this department. And they intervene, and they have so many different components, and even the police is trained to handle um, refugees and refugee cases. So they, the, and when it comes to uh, health care or access to health, uh, in the case of, for instance, Ukrainian refugees and their influx, southern influx into European countries, they're all assigned to a um, uh, health care provider and insurance that a doctor can put, use that code and automatically it will be charged and paid um, for the services that they're providing to the um, uh, newly ar arrival refugees. So they have set up a systematic, step-by-step -step plan when they come in from screening, for instance, in the case of uh, communicable diseases, tuberculosis or whatever it is, it is, is there. They check it very quick, and they have full access to healthcare. And uh, there is children benefit in the form of, they call it Kindergeld in, the, in Germany, or child money. Uh, all refugee children are uh, eligible to that. It's about 100, um, almost 200 euro uh, per child. So these systems are built into, and these are not like new, a little bit older, but they added many more major measures in order to um, accommodate and make the transition smoother to the local population. L the language courses all free for refugees, regardless of their status and all they can uh, atten attend. Um, enrollment into schools are all um, provided and, is, and including enrollment into colleges, um, which is uh, tuition free. And I just wanna add, um, that is very helpful. I'm learning a lot too, but uh, there's refugee processing centers all over. And there, a lot of them are strategically placed in the areas where there's close proximity to the affected areas where refugees are. And so for example, in my case, I talked about, use my own example of going from Bosnia to Serbia, and in Serbia, in Belgrade, there was the International Organization for Migration Office. And everyone knew that office was there. And so if you wanted to apply, you go there and you apply. And so it was very, and this was before cell phones, <laughs> I mean, the access, but there is a, uh, I can tell you, refugees are survivors, as was said in that video. They're very resourceful. They will learn from one another, and it spreads like fire. And so phones do help a lot. A lot of them use apps like WhatsApp and Viber and so on. And again, the world travels fast, faster than you can imagine. Uh, we heard at Fort McCoy that you know people in Afghanistan already knew what was happening. It was like, oh my God, how quickly. And so, um, so those are, yes, very, very Googleable. <laughs> That's not even a word, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation. It was really great. Um, one of the things that strikes me when we talk about um, how we interact with our lawmakers and the people we elect and putting that pressure on there. It strikes me that right now we seem to be in a period of um, extreme nationalism, and it doesn't ne necessarily um, matter which side of the aisle you're on. You're seeing it um, on both sides. 
And I guess, and, and I'm sure you don't have a magic wand, but if you do, I would love to hear about how do we have conversations about um, you know, exploring how our interactions with the world um, can benefit us and keep us safer abroad um, so we can cut down on the war spending, um, but also invite people into our world um, in a way that's meaningful for all of us. I'm just going to say one thing, and then I, I know how passionate you are about this topic. Uh, refugee resettlement used to be a bipartisan non-issue. Non-issue. Everyone was on the same page that refugees were a great asset to our communities in many ways. Culture, cuisine, language, uh, you know, the whole it takes a village type thing, and economy. Oh my God, refugees give back tenfold in so many ways. They are best employees, they retain their jobs, they don't quit on their jobs, they're you know, persistent, they, they make workplaces much better. And so that's all I'm gonna say is like, it used to be a non-issue and then suddenly within the last 10 years or so, we're starting to see the divide. So go ahead, thank you. Um, thank you for the question here. Um, there are so much to learn from others and also offer our lesson, lear our lesson learned to, um, uh, to others. In the case of um, Europe, for instance, um, I was uh, visiting the um, community policing, and they have a number of different programs. And there was a survey in Germany, and the question was that, uh, who are the most trusted and respected? Um, profession in the country. Number one was were medical doctors. Number two were the police. I said, it doesn't make sense how it is possible. And these are the ones that forcing people to do certain things, you know, giving you tickets when you drive fast and, uh, and, and, and so forth, so on. The um, training to handle, to communicate with citizens it uh, especially um, it, it considered a part of their job. And people are not afraid of law enforcement. And law enforcement is not really militarized, the uh, level that we have in the United States. And these are individuals who are trained, and it is not easy to become a police officer. They have to go through many different cultural and civic education in order to um, put the uniform and come out and do their job. So um, it, it, when it uh, comes to communication, they use many different uh, means. Um, for instance, uh, for the coming refugees, churches are very active and very closely working with, with the different state agencies in order to understand um, their community. Uh, when I went to in Belgium, for instance, or in France, and there are neighborhoods that nobody speaks the national language. You think it, you're in a different country. It is similar to some of our Chinatowns in different parts of the United States. But the authority, the national authority, for instance, the city of Paris or um, in Berlin, and they know what's going on, and there is a significant cooperation uh, with various different ethnic groups, either with, they are Turks or the Kurds or Afghans or Arabs or uh, Moroccans or um, uh, Africans. There is a system that has been set and they try to mobilize and have that kind of communication. And even in the United States, as I, I uh, work in the city of New Haven, in the city of Hartford, um, in the city of Hartford, I was involved in a communication, in a actually mediation between the police and the um, people that we call them organized crime in order to make this, the, the uh, streets safe. In New Haven, I work with the youth community development um, through Yale University. I was a student at the time at Yale. And uh, I, we visited the juvenile center and uh, the youngest that I interviewed was 12 years old and 
um, was arrested uh, f um, uh, for um, auto theft, and he and four other they uh, were stealing cars, were arrested in India. When you sit with them uh, after a moment, you, you you really forget that these are these are the innocent one who is the guilty one. So when it comes to refugees and the refugee population, when they come here, and um, even today we had the discussion that we have uh, ethnic groups uh, here in Wisconsin, and they are within their own communities, that is a normal thing when you go many different places. But if you treat each other or treat these communities and minority according to the Constitution, it doesn't matter who speaks what within their own families or within even their own communities. As far as they are, believe in the Constitution and believe in the rule of law and then want to have a healthy community. So communication, there are massive amount of experience across the Atlantic and we are hoping that WIPs um, um, have programs to establish the citizen dialogue across the Atlantic and also across the United States um, in order to learn better lessons and, uh, um, and inform um, policymakers and those who are in the position of um, bringing changes. And I, would, I, would, well. I would add, Mayor, um, you have the power. And your power is really in that communication, is to educate other mayors to educate other local officials about your experience and experiences of your community to open their doors and their arms to others. One thing that came as a silver lining from the executive order under President Trump that had to do with obtaining consents from local officials. So we had to obtain written consents from local officials within our state to allow to resettle refugees in their municipalities. And we all went crazy, because we thought it was the craziest thing in the world. How dare he? And then I thought about it. And, and then I thought, while the enforcement of this is not what I would prefer, the idea is right. The local officials really need to be educated on who's coming into their communities. Not because they can control it, stop it, whatever, but if we educate them about all the benefits that these communities are bringing, they're gonna be more on board to walk the walk with us and help us and support us. And therefore, I believe that having you and others like you share your experience is more powerful in getting the legislator to, legislation to understand the issues, the concerns, but also the solutions to our problems. And so I'm going to volunteer you for things. <laughs> okay, I think we have time for one more question. And I think someone already has a mic. Oh, uh, yeah, this is a follow-up to an earlier, earlier question about the, the whole intake process abroad. And I, I was wondering how that has been impacted in in different places by you know by conflict for in, for instance i've i've heard about uh refugees having trouble getting out of yemen because there's no place to go you know there are many there was mention of uh large numbers of refugees being housed in you know in iran presumably those people have no no means of making it to a uh, to an american embassy and so forth Well, I can say from my perspective that um, going from, so we went from, when President Obama left the office, the ceiling was set at 100,000 people. Uh, yeah, was it? Yeah. Oh no, 110,000 refugees for that year. There are these processing centers overseas that were equipped to handle that many, that processing, right? So there was enough capacity to handle that much. When President Trump took office, they slashed that number to 50,000 right away, and then by the time he left the office, the ceiling was at 10,000. Can you imagine? 10,000 is what Texas gets on an average. Not even a year, I don't even think. I think they get much more. 
So 10,000. Uh, with that, the capacity overseas was completely dying, right? Because it was killed. There was no, I mean, you're not gonna keep 20 staff to process 20 people, right? So then COVID hit. <laughs> All these things took place, and then Afghanistan happened. Ukraine happened. All these things are happening. They're putting a lot more pressure on country, receiving countries like the United States. And so there are some priorities, some natural priorities that you can see in that, and then that capacity is still being rebuilt. So I think there's a number of factors that are playing a role in these centers overseas operating. I'm sure my colleague has more insight, but that's from my perspective and from what I know. In many areas, like uh, refugees in Iran, um, Yemen, and uh, some part of Africa, even within Latin America, um, it is impossible for them. Many of them, um, they are kind of facing a very tall wall in front of them, and there is no way to vet them. In the case of Afghanistan, we have 70,000 people eligible for a special immigration visa. We don't have facility down there. They have to travel to uh, Pakistan or India or some other countries. And it is impossible. And even the intention that they are, uh, if the Taliban authority knew that they are applying for such a visa, um, it will cost their life. And it is the same thing in Iran. And uh, it is the same thing in Yemen. And Yemen is one of those uh, uh, countries that um, the indigenous population and the, um, their refugees in this place are so neglected, they are so locked, and they cannot get out and go anywhere. And, uh, and the number of uh, infant mort mortality and maternal mortality is just, is just sickening. Um, and it is a similar uh, uh, issue. So refugee resettlement is not a solution. It is just a um, temporary um, um, effort in order to help some. As I showed you on the slide, a very teeny, tiny portion of the global refugee seeking asylum. The absolute majority of them want to go back. And it is our job in order to, um, this is my argument, in order to bankrolling our engagement in some of these conflicts and wars. If we can invest in the uh, sustainable development program and projects through the USAID, through the State Department, and through many other institutions that we have, and, uh, and also um, support National Endowment for Democracy, USAIP, and so many other institutions we have at the national level and international level, through the many of the UN agencies. We can reach out to many of them and provide the needed, needed resources in form of job tra training, um, environmental issue. It, it takes really not too much. Um, the, uh, so that is the way forward. If that hasn't been uh, push forward, and if we cannot find an alternative for um, engaging in the conflict and the foreign wars, foreign conflict and foreign war, through um, conflict management effort, and not reducing the level of Jew political violence, it is too high now. It is too dangerous. God forbid, if the escalation of war in Ukraine spread, and uh, and the possibility of Spreading is very significant. And even I have friends, they call me, what the hell are you doing in Europe? Come back. There is possibility of the usage of uh, nu tactical nuclear uh, weapon in Ukraine. And a, I, went, I have been in a number of uh, fundraising for the U Ukrainian civilian efforts, especially in the medical area. It just breaks your heart. And I have friends and colleagues from Ukraine. And uh, um, so the number of Ukrainians are dying, a number of Russians are dying. It is significant. To what end? So these are the kind of conflicts that produced 
this num 100 million population, 100 million people across the globe, and they are wa wandering, and the majority of them cannot go back. And, and a fraction of them may or may not land in our communities. But refugee resettlement is not a solution. We have to have a different approach in our foreign policy, and the resources that we need at home that need, 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 needs to stay at home. And within the, this doesn't mean that the Department of Defense or our men and women in services are mistreated in, in this kind of conversation. They have done their job more than we asked for. As I've mentioned at the dinner table, in North Carolina, um, I visited one of the families um, for six years ago. One son were killed in Iraq, the others killed in Afghanistan. So when we were sitting on the dinner table, there were two empty chairs. And the uncle tried to ask me, so what is the result? Think about what they feel they, now, what's going on in that family. After what had happened in Afghanistan, the hotline within the Veteran Administration went to the roof. It just caused so much trauma and mental anguish across the veteran communities who have served for 20 years. I mean, if you had a child in 2001, now it is a 20-year man. And, uh, and they are asking these questions to themselves and to authority, and, uh, and that is war causes a lot of anguish. It damages. You have seen 400 um, Syrians were killed. And Ukrainian, I do believe it is over 100,000 people were killed already within one year. It is too much with, for a country. 12 million people are displaced. And uh, about a, a country has only 40 million people. In the case of Syria, for instance. After all, who will pay for the construction of these countries? On the top of that, within the deficit that we have, national deficit and national debt in the United States, which is over close to $40 trillion, with the federal government budget of $1.7 trillion, who will pay for the debt? How we pay for the interest? We owe to Chinese almost uh, $1 trillion, the money that we borrowed and in invest in these conflicts. So it must be, it requires every one of these, our, our citizens, every one of us to think twice. In the case of Afghanistan, when was the last time your representative from the U.S. Congress came to your town hall, town, town hall and gave you a report? And you should ask, how come after 20 years everything collapses? You should ask why we allow the Taliban to take control of $83 billion worth of weapon system. So I stop here. Thank you for your patience. Um, before we all uh, head on our way, we do have copies of the Consequence Journal for sale in the back. And Nehemiah, can you just very quickly sure. tell us what that is? The journal is actually produced by uh, a Consequence Forum, originally uh, established by uh, uh, George Kovach, who was a Vietnam veteran and suffers from uh, PSD. And uh, um, so over the time, um, this journal became the front line of presenting arts literature. It is a literary uh, journal that um, bring the perspective and the experiences of combatants, victims, and witnesses. It is fun to read. And there is a large number of volunteer editors, and these are professional editors that work in editing. And we have received, I'm on the board of directors of this organization, and we received um, um, last year uh, over 600 um, poems 
um, uh, short stories and uh, illustration of art, both fiction and nonfiction. And it is really fun to read. It gives you really a sense of what's going on. It re re relates you through art and literature. And there are copies here you can take with you. And, but please, uh, they are also for sale. That send it to us. And uh, you can donate about $20 a piece um, through their website. And the information is on the journal as well. So if you don't have cash with you tonight, you can still take a journal, and then we will take your email address and send you the information on how to make the donation to the Consequence Forum online. And for anybody who is watching on uh, YouTube, send an email to info at whips.org if you'd like a copy, and we'll make sure that you get one. Um, our next event will be two weeks from today. It's a, going to be a panel discussion featuring a lot of people who are here who have been working with um, the, the newcomers. And we hope to see you then. And please join me in thanking our, our wonderful guests.